Whiskey in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter thirty nine. The Yankees fight with the Knights. Home again at Camelot. A morning or two later, I found the paper damp from the press by my plate at the breakfast table. I turned to the advertising columns, knowing I should find something of personal interest to me there. It was this De par le roi. Know that the great lord and illustrious knight, Sir Sagramore le Desirous, having condescended to meet the king's minister, Hank Morgan, the which is surnamed the Boss, for satisfaction of offence anciently given, these will engage in the lists by Camelot about the fourth hour of the morning of the sixteenth day of this next succeeding month. The battle will be one outrance, sith the said offence was of a deadly sort, admitting of no composition. Clarence's editorial reference to this affair was to this effect. It will be observed by a glance at our advertising columns that the community is to be favored with a treat of unusual interest in the tournament line. The names of the artists are warrant of good entertainment. The box office will be open at noon of the 13th. Admission three cents, reserved seats five. Proceeds to go to the hospital fund. The royal pair and all the court will be present. With these exceptions, and the press and the clergy, the free list is strictly suspended. Parties are hereby warned against buying tickets of speculators. They will not be good at the door. Everybody knows and likes the boss. Everybody knows and likes Sir Sag. Come, let us give the lads a good send-off. Remember, the proceeds go to a great and free charity and one whose broad benevolence stretches out its helping hand warm with the blood of a loving heart to all that suffer regardless of race creed condition or color the only charity yet established in the earth which has no politico-religious stopcock on its compassion but says here flows the stream let all come and drink turn out all hands fetch along your dough-nuts and your gum-drops and have a good time pie for sale on the grounds and rocks to crack it with and circus lemonade three drops of lime juice to a barrel of water n b this is the first tournament under the new law which allow each combatant to use any weapon he may prefer you may want to make a note of that up to the day set there was no talk in all Britain of anything but this combat. All other topics sank into insignificance and passed out of men's thoughts and interest. It was not because a tournament was a great matter. It was not because Sir Sagramore had found the Holy Grail, for he had not, but had failed. It was not because the second, official, personage in the kingdom was one of the duelists. No, all these features were commonplace. Yet there was abundant reason for the extraordinary interest which this coming fight was creating. It was born of the fact that all the nation knew that this was not to be a duel between mere men, so to speak, but a duel between two mighty magicians, a duel not of muscle, but of mind, not of human skill, but of superhuman art and craft, a final struggle for supremacy between the two master enchanters of the age. It was realized that the most prodigious achievements of the most renowned knights could not be worthy of comparison with a spectacle like this. They could be but child's play, contrasted with this mysterious and awful battle of the gods. Yes, all the world knew it was going to be in reality a duel between Merlin and me, a measuring of his magic powers against mine. It was known that Merlin had been busy whole days and nights together imbuing Sir Sagramore's arms and armor with supernal powers of offense and defense, and that he had procured for him, from the spirits of the air, a fleecy veil which would render the wearer invisible to his antagonist while still visible to other men. Against Sir Sagramore, so weaponed and protected, a thousand knights could accomplish nothing. Against him no known enchantments could prevail these facts were sure regarding them there was no doubt no reason for doubt there was but one question 
might there be still other enchantments unknown to merlin which could render sir sagramor's veil transparent to me and make his enchanted mail vulnerable to my weapons this was the one thing to be decided in the lists until then the world must remain in suspense so the world thought there was a vast matter at stake here and the world was right but it was not the one they had in their minds no a far vaster one was upon the cast of this die the life of knight-errantry i was a champion it was true but not the champion of the frivolous black arts i was the champion of hard unsentimental common sense and reason i was entering the lists to either destroy knight-errantry or be its victim vast as the showgrounds were there were no vacant spaces in them outside of the lists at ten o'clock on the morning of the sixteenth the mammoth grandstand was clothed in flags streamers and rich tapestries and packed with several acres of small fry tributary kings their suites and the british aristocracy with our own royal gang in the chief place and each and every individual a flashing prism of gaudy silks and velvets well i never saw anything to begin with it but a fight between an upper mississippi sunset and the aurora borealis the huge camp of beflagged and gay-colored tents at one end of the lists with a stiff standing sentinel at every door and a shining shield hanging by him for challenge was another fine sight you see every knight was there who had any ambition or any cast feeling for my feeling toward their order was not much of a secret and so here was their chance if i won my fight with sir sagramor others would have the right to call me out as long as i might be willing to respond down at our end there were but two tents one for me and another for my servants at the appointed hour the king made a sign and the heralds in their tabards appeared and made proclamation naming the combatants and stating the cause of quarrel there was a pause then a ringing bugle blast which was the signal for us to come forth all the multitude caught their breath and an eager curiosity flashed into every face out from his tent rode great sir sagramor an imposing tower of iron stately and rigid his huge spear standing upright in its socket and grasped in his strong hand his grand horse's face and breast cased in steel his body clothed in rich trappings that almost dragged the ground oh a most noble picture a great shout went up of welcome and admiration and then out i came but i didn't get any shout there was a wondering and eloquent silence for a moment then a great wave of laughter began to sweep along that human sea but a warning bugle blast cut its career short i was in the simplest and comfortablest of gymnast costumes flesh-colored tights from neck to heel with blue silk puffings about my loins and bareheaded my horse was not above medium size but he was alert slender-limbed muscled with watch springs and just a greyhound to go he was a beauty glossy as silk and naked as he was when he was born except for bridle and ranger saddle the iron tower and the gorgeous bedquilt came cumbrously but gracefully pirouetting down the lists and we tripped lightly up to meet them we halted the tower saluted i responded then we wheeled and rode side by side to the grandstand and faced our king and queen to whom we made obeisance the queen exclaimed alack sir boss wilt fight naked and without lance or sword or but the king checked her and made her understand with a polite phrase or two that this was none of her business the bugles rang again and we separated and rode to the ends of the lists and took position now old merlin stepped into view and cast a dainty web of gossamer threads over sir sagramor which turned him into hamlet's ghost the king made a sign the bugles blew sir sagramor laid his great lance in rest and the next moment here he came thundering down the course with his veil flying out behind and i went whistling through the air like an arrow to meet him cocking my ear the while as if noting the invisible knight's position and progress by hearing not sight a chorus of encouraging shouts burst out for him 
and one brave voice flung out a heartening word for me said go it slim jim it was an even bet that clarence had procured that favor for me and furnished the language too when that formidable lance point was within a yard and a half of my breast i twitched my horse aside without an effort and the big knight swept by scoring a blank i got plenty of applause that time we turned braced up and down we came again another blank for the knight a roar of applause for me this same thing was repeated once more and it fetched such a whirlwind of applause that sir sagramore lost his temper and at once changed his tactics and set himself the task of chasing me down why he hadn't any show in the world at that it was a game of tag with all the advantage on my side i whirled out of his path with ease whenever i chose and once i slapped him on the back as i went to the rear finally i took the chase into my own hands and after that turn or twist or do what he would he was never able to get behind me again he found himself always in front at the end of his maneuver so he gave up that business and retired to his end of the lists his temper was clear gone now and he forgot himself and flung an insult at me which disposed of mine i slipped my lasso from the horn of my saddle and grasped the coil in my right hand this time you should have seen him come it was a business trip sure by his gait there was blood in his eye i was sitting my horse at ease and swinging the great loop of my lasso in wide circles about my head the moment he was under way i started for him when the space between us had narrowed to forty feet, I sent the snaky spirals of the rope a-cleavin' through the air, then darted aside and faced about, and brought my trained animal to a halt with all his feet braced under him for a surge. The next moment the rope sprang taut and yanked Sir Sagramore out of the saddle. Great Scott, but there was a sensation! Unquestionably, the popular thing in this world is novelty. These people had never seen anything of that cowboy business before, and it carried them clear off their feet with delight. From all around and everywhere the shout went up, Encore! Encore! I wondered where they got the word, but there was no time to cipher on philological matters, because the whole night errantry hive was just humming now, and my prospect for trade couldn't have been better. The moment my lasso was released, and Sir Sagramore had been assisted to his tent, I hauled in the slack, took my station, and began to swing my loop around my head again. I was sure to have use for it as soon as they could elect a successor for Sir Sagramore, and that couldn't take long, or there were so many hungry candidates. Indeed, they elected one straight off, Sir Hervis de Revel. Bzzz! Here he came, like a house afire. I dodged. He passed like a flash, with my horsehair coils settling around his neck. A second or so later, whoosh, the saddle was empty. I got another encore, and another, and another, and still another. When I had snaked five men out, things began to look serious to the ironclads, and they stopped and consulted together. As a result, they decided that it was time to waive etiquette and send their greatest and best against me. To the astonishment of that little world, I lassoed Sir Lamarack de Gallis, and after him sir galahad so you see there was simply nothing to be done now but play their right bower bring out the superbest of the superb the mightiest of the mighty the great sir lancelot himself a proud moment for me i should think so yonder was arthur king of britain yonder was guinevere yes and whole tribes of little provincial kings and kinglets and in the tented camp yonder renowned knights from many lands and likewise the selectest body known to chivalry the knights of the table round the most illustrious in christendom and biggest fact of all the very sun of their shining system was yonder couching his lance the focal point of forty thousand adoring eyes and all by myself here was i laying for him across my mind flitted the dear image of a certain hello girl of west hartford and i wish she could see me now in that moment down came the invincible with the rush of a whirlwind the courtly world rose to its feet and bent forward the fateful coils went circling through the air and before you could wink i was towing sir lancelot across the field on his back 
and kissing my hand to the storm of waving kerchiefs and the thunder-crash of applause that greeted me. Said I to myself, as I coiled my lariat and hung it on my saddle-horn and sat there drunk with glory, the victory is perfect, no other will venture against me, knight-errantry is dead. Now imagine my astonishment, and everybody else's, too, to hear the peculiar bugle-call which announces that another competitor is about to enter the lists. There was a mystery here. I couldn't account for this thing. Next I noticed Merlin gliding away from me, and then I noticed that my lasso was gone. The old sleight-of-hand expert had stolen it, sure, and slipped it under his robe. The bugle blew again. I looked, and down came Sagramore riding again with his dust brushed off and his veil nicely rearranged. I trotted up to meet him, and pretended to find him by the sound of his horse's hoofs. He said, "'Thou art quick of ear, but it will not save thee from this,' and he touched the hilt of his great sword and ye are not able to see it because of the influence of the veil, know that it is no cumbrous lance, but a sword, and I ween ye will not be able to avoid it. His visor was up, and there was death in his smile. I should never be able to dodge his sword, that was plain. Somebody was going to die this time. If he got the drop on me, I could name the corpse. We rode forward together and saluted the royalties. This time the king was disturbed. He said, where is thy strange weapon? It is stolen, sire. Hast another at hand? No, sire, I brought only the one. Then Merlin mixed in. He brought but the one, because there was but the one to bring. There exists none other but that one. It belongeth to the king of the demons of the sea. This man is a pretender, and ignorant, else he had known that that weapon can be used in but eight bouts only and then it vanisheth away to its home under the sea. Then he is weaponless, said the king. Sir Sagramore, ye will grant him leave to borrow. And I will lend, said Sir Launcelot, limping up. He is as brave a knight of his hands as any that be on live, and he shall have mine. He put his hand on his sword to draw it, but Sir Sagramore said, Stay, it may not be he shall fight with his own weapons. It was his privilege to choose them and bring them. If he has erred, on his head be it. Knight, said the king, thou art overwrought with passion. It disorders thy mind. Wouldst kill a naked man? An he do it, he shall answer to me, said Sir Launcelot. I will answer it to any he that desireth, retorted Sir Sagramore hotly. Merlin broke in, rubbing his hands and smiling his low down a smile of malicious gratification. "'Tis well said, right well said, and tis enough of parleying. Let my lord the king deliver the battle signal." The king had to yield. The bugle made proclamation, and we turned apart and rode to our stations. There we stood a hundred yards apart, facing each other, rigid and motionless, like horsed statues. And so we remained in a soundless hush as much as a full minute, everybody gazing, nobody stirring. It seemed as if the king could not take heart to give the signal. But at last he lifted his hand, the clear note of the bugle followed. Sir Sagramore's long blade described a flashing curve in the air, and it was superb to see him come. I sat still. On he came. I did not move. People got so excited that they shouted to me, "'Fly! Fly! Save thyself! This is Murther! I never budged so much as an inch till that thundering apparition had got within fifteen paces of me. Then I snatched a dragoon revolver out of my holster. There was a flash and a roar, and the revolver was back in the holster before anybody could tell what had happened. Here was a riderless horse plunging by, and yonder lay Sir Sagramore, stone dead. The people that ran to him were stricken dumb to find that the life was actually gone out of the man, and no reason for it visible, no hurt upon his body, nothing like a wound. There was a hole through the breast of his chain-mail, but they attached no importance to a little thing like that, and as a bullet wound there produces but little blood, none came in sight because of the clothing and swaddlings under the armor. The body was dragged over to let the king and the swells look down upon it. 
they were stupefied with astonishment naturally i was requested to come and explain the miracle but i remained in my tracks like a statue and said if it is a command i will come but my lord the king knows that i am where the laws of combat require me to remain while any desire to come against me i waited nobody challenged then i said if there are any who doubt that this field is well and fairly won i do not wait for them to challenge me i challenge them it is a gallant offer said the king and well beseems you whom will you name first i name none i challenge all here i stand and dare the chivalry of england to come against me not by individuals but in mass what shouted a score of knights you have heard the challenge take it or i proclaim you recreant knights and vanquished every one it was a bluff you know at such a time it is sound judgment to put on a bold face and play your hand for a hundred times what it is worth forty-nine times out of fifty nobody dares to call and you rake in the chips but just this once well things looked squally in just no time five hundred knights were scrambling into their saddles and before you could wink a widely scattering drove were under way and clattering down upon me i snatched both revolvers from the holsters and began to measure distances and calculate chances bang one saddle empty bang another one bang bang and i bagged two well it was nip and tuck with us and i knew it if i spent the eleventh shot without convincing these people the twelfth man would kill me sure and so i never did feel so happy as i did when my ninth downed its man and i detected the wavering in the crowd which was premonitory of panic an instant lost now could knock out my last chance but i didn't lose it i raised both revolvers and pointed them the halted host stood their ground just about one good square moment then broke and fled the day was mine knight errantry was a doomed institution the march of civilization was begun how did i feel ah you never could imagine it and brer merlin his stock was flat again somehow every time the magic of falderall tried conclusions with the magic of science the magic of falderall got left End of chapter thirty nine